Hello and welcome to Lifespan Development Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole and I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College. And today we're going over Chapter 6, Middle Childhood. So let's first start talking about the physical development in middle childhood. So rates of growth generally slow during middle childhood with the typical child gaining 5 to 7 pounds and growing 2 inches annually. Growth spurts tend to happen earlier for girls around the ages of 9 to 10 than comparatively to boys from 11 to 12, and there is a tendency to slim down and gain muscle and lung capacity. The brain reaches its adult size at 7 but continues developing after. Most children lose their first tooth at age 6 and continue losing teeth until around age 12. Nearly 20% of school-age American children are obese, at least 20% over the ideal weight, partly due to diet and partly due to sedentary activities. Obese children run the risk of lower self-esteem, orthopedic issues, and increased risk of heart disease and stroke in adulthood. Diet is not effective for weight loss in children because of the impact to metabolic rate, so focus for weight loss should be on increasing activity. Now let's look at the cognitive development in middle childhood. So during this stage, we have, and we've discussed Piaget's theory of cognitive development in several chapters, so let's focus in a little bit more. From ages 7 to 11, children, according to Piaget, will experience this concrete operational stage. And so from these ages, children master the use of logic in concrete ways and is able to use inductive reasoning to make conclusions. So concrete refers to things that can be seen, touched, or experienced directly. And another difficulty during this stage is the concept of conservation. So something that we're having to navigate is, for example, if I were to, give, to show you two cups of water that were equal in the amount that was poured into them, and then I introduce an empty, tall, cylindrical cup that's skinny, well, whenever I take one of those cups and I pour it into the tall, cylindrical one, a child who has not developed a sense of conservation just yet is going to say that there's more water in the tall cylindrical cup simply because it's taller. Okay, So conservation is the understanding that just because something changes in its size, shape, or container, it remains the same amount. Okay, So now let's talk about memory. So there are a few processes in memory, encoding, storage, and retrieval. Now, sensory memory is the very first process where we are receiving that uh, sensory information. And the encoding process is like a filtration of what is important versus what is not. And so what I find fascinating about sensory memory, there's this phenomenon called the Stroop effect, where when there's an incongruence in sensory information, it takes our brain a little bit longer to process it. So for example, if I were to show you the word red, but the color or the font uh, was blue, and I were to ask you to state the color, not the word, what's the color of that word, it would take your brain a little bit longer to uh, filter it all that out and say the color of that word is blue even though it says red. So once we have encoded information we will move it into working memory aka short-term memory and so whenever it comes to working memory we can hold about seven items give or take a couple depending on the person for about 20 seconds. So when I, this is whenever meaningful information moves from sensory memory into working memory, as mentioned, which consists of information we are immediately and consciously aware of, but it has that limited space, like I mentioned, approximately seven items. All right. So, But there are ways in which we can move information to long-term memory through uh, things such as association, through like acronyms, as well as repetition, constantly repeating something. And with long-term memory, it seemingly has an unlimited capacity, and it consists of things we know or we can remember if asked. So what's, what good is that long-term memory if we can't retrieve it? That's the third process of memory, and it entails a few items, recall, recognition, versus relearning. And with relearning, whenever we first are introduced to information, it will take us, uh, you know, it'll be a lot harder on that initial on that initial attempt but each time we're reintroduced to that information it gets e it gets easier to relearn it each time then you've got 
recall versus recognition, and this is why people don't like fill in the blank tasks comparatively to multiple choice, because recall it includes remembering information without a cue or a prompt. So you actually have to know that information uh, without anything else supporting your memory. And But then again, that's why people like multiple choice tests because it's utilizing recognition. So it's a lot easier to remember information whenever we see the two paired in their environment once again. Let's talk about language development in middle childhood. So by fifth grade, a child's vocabulary has grown to about 40,000 words at a rate of 20 words per day. Children are able to think about objects in less literal ways and develop more sophisticated vocabulary that allows them to tell jokes. School-aged children are also able to learn new grammar rules with more flexibility. And so the school years may be the best time to be taught a second language. I know for a lot of us, we don't take a second language until we're in high school in our uh, latter years of our uh, secondary education. But I would argue, hey, let's maybe try to introduce a second language earlier in life because it's never impossible to learn a new language, but it's definitely easier to, uh, to learn a language in childhood comparatively to as being an adult. So let's talk about some educational issues during middle childhood. So we all have probably heard of the term dyslexia, dysgraphia, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but let's dive into it a little bit more. So dyslexia is a neurobiological uh, in origin and is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition, as well as poor spelling and decoding abilities presenting reading difficulties. Dyslexia is one of the most common diagnosed disabilities and appears to be rooted in some neurological problems involving parts of the brain active in recognizing letter, verbally responding, and manipulating sound. So what this may look like for somebody who has dyslexia is uh, the words, or excuse me, the letters in the words may be flipped around, obviously causing difficulty in uh, processing the, uh, the words that they're reading or, uh, you know, with dysgraphia, uh, it's characterized by, you know, difficulty, you know, writing words. So they're kind of related, but they are a bit different. Now, ADHD, we've all at least heard of in passing, is considered neurobiological and behavioral, resulting in difficulty staying on task, screening out distractions, and inhibiting behavioral outbursts. So with ADHD, it's there's the DSM-4 had ADD, but that's no longer the case in DSM-5. In the DSM-5, our most latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. And so as long as an individual qualifies for either attention deficit and or hyperactivity symptoms, they would qualify for ADHD. So treatment for ADHD commonly includes medications in the form of st stimulants, so these are uh, forms of amphetamines as well as Ritalin. Uh, and so that's what's the common like immediate snapshot response to treat some uh, child who has ADHD. But there are other ways such as structuring the classroom environment, tutoring, as well as the parent's education is taken into account. Okay, so research suggests that several brain structures may be implicated in ADHD, and there is significant controversy can, uh, about medicating children with ADHD, um, because I feel like nowadays you see an uptick in the prescription of ADHD when children really don't need it, and so there's this over-prescription and this over-medicated population with children who really don't need to be taking uh, an altering substance in the form of stimulants at such a young age while their brain is still developing. Now, when it comes to uh, in all the forms of intelligence, we, we know, at least I would hope so, uh, that there are multiple forms of intelligences, even intelligences that are not uh, necessarily measured by a form of standardized testing. So Gardner suggests that there are nine domains of intelligence. So you've got some of them that can be measured by IQ tests or standardized testing, such as logical, mathematic, linguistic, and spatial skills. So those can be measured, but things like musical, uh, bodily kinesthetic, naturalistic, 
those children who are uh, have a high sense of emotional intelligence or EQ with interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. So interpersonal being between people and intrapersonal regarding the self. These are not measured by standard IQ tests, but they are important for success in a variety of fields. Now, Sternberg offers this triarchic theory of intelligence where there's three domains. You've got your individuals who are academically inclined or your book smart. So this includes the ability to solve problems of logic, verbal comprehension, vocabulary, and spatial abilities. You've got your creative people, uh, which includes the ability to apply newly found skills to novel situations. So they don't suffer as much from functional fixedness as some individuals do. So functional fixedness, which is a concept we went through in Introduction to Psychology, is the difficulty in seeing things for being used for anything other than what they were intentionally supposed to be used for. But my creative people, they like to be, of course, creative and seek new solutions to problems. As well as those individuals who have practical skills. So for lack of better terms, you can kind of think of this like your street smarts, the ability to use common sense and to know what is called for in a situation. So now let's move toward emotional and social development in middle childhood. So at during this time, friendships are really crucial and the peer influence is more so taken into account than the parents. Um, and so friendships during middle childhood take on that new importance and provide the opportunity for learning social skills, will, which include communication and conflict management. And being accepted by other children is, is an important source of affirmation and self-esteem. But peer rejection, alternatively, can potentially foreshadow later behavioral problems. So let's go through these four domains. Popular pro-social children have the tendency to do well in school and are cooperative and friendly. Your popular antisocial children, they may gain popularity by acting tough or spreading rumors. Now withdraw withdrawn rejected children, they may be, and I hate to use this term, but easy targets for bullies because they're unlikely to retaliate. Aggressive rejected children have the tendency to be ostracized and may act out due to insecurity. So now let's conclude on talking about stressors in middle childhood. So as mentioned, during middle childhood uh, phase, children spend less time with parents and more with peers. And Berger identified five family functions, providing food, clothing and shelter, encouraging learning, developing self-esteem, nurturing friendships with peers, and providing harmony and stability. Really crucial. A good home environment is defined in which the child's physical, cognitive, emotional, and social needs are adequately met. And I find this study in 2002, it happened several decades ago, uh, by Hetherington and Kelly. You can Google that particular citation there and take a look for yourself. This is whenever we, tend to, we uh, like to have class discussion about this particular study because it tends to be controversial in nature. So this study states that about three-quarters of children and adults who experience divorce suffer no long-term effects, which you can say is maybe con con uh, controversial in nature because as an anecdotal and snapshot reaction, uh, people have the tendency to think automatically that uh, being a child uh, or uh, of divorce has an impact on um, – the adult or child as they you know age either behavioral cognitive or otherwise so I find that to be fascinating and a healthy class discussion which we can all take from that utilize experience either of others or potentially ourselves and see what that uh, looks like for people so I'm not saying the statistic as a means to influence your perspective necessarily but to get you thinking about this and uh, divorce in a more in-depth um, in-depth perspective I guess you could say okay and so some negative consequences of divorce are a result of financial hardship I, I, no, no matter what throughout history uh, among the top if not number one cause of divorce is a result of finances so that's where we're going to conclude today uh, for chapter six middle childhood 
I hope to see you in Chapter 7 for that topic, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.